Let's humbly bow. <clears throat> Our great God and Father in heaven, we know that myriads of heavenly beings around your throne praise you in song in heaven, and we are thankful that on earth this evening, in our crowd here, that we can do the same. You are worthy of praise, and we're grateful that we can unite our voices in song this evening to sing praises to you, to encourage ourselves, to come to you in prayer to study a portion of your word. You are the creator of the universe. You are our maker. And we are reminded this week, as we go back to the beginning of that awesome fact, we pray this evening that we are offering up a worship that is worthy of your high and holy name. We're thankful for those who have planned these series of lessons this week. We're thankful for their work in the kingdom. We're thankful for our safe travels. We're thankful for an opportunity to study from your word this week. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. Thank you for coming from heaven to tell us who you are, to send your son to die on the cross, to send your Holy Spirit to reveal a truth that can guide us each day. Thank you for revealing who you are so that we can be like you. We pray that we are children of obedience and that we are children like our Heavenly Father and that we are taking on those attributes that you would have for us and following your example each and every day. When we fall short of that, we ask that you would forgive us. Lord, we're thankful for our brother who will proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ to us this evening. We're thankful for his efforts and all of those who are speaking this week. We're mindful of those men who labor in the gospel and we pray that you would uphold their hands and the labor that they do and their families the sacrifices that they make, we pray that you would uphold them, encourage them, give them strength to continue proclaiming the great gospel. Lord, we look out this evening, we see the hoary head, we see the Christian who has been faithful for many years and who is setting that example for us, and we pray that we would follow their example. We're thankful for the many brethren who are here this evening, who have lived many years in the kingdom and serving you, and they are an example to us. They are an example to the young people who are here this evening. We pray for them as well, that they grow up and be faithful Christians in your sight. Lord, we're thankful that we can be together as a spiritual family. and We pray that we would be built up in the most holy faith as we have an opportunity to gather together each day this week. We pray as we have sung this evening about your greatness and your glory that one day, having heard, well done, good and faithful servant, we can sing praises around that throne for all eternity. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, and amen. Thank you, Chris. Let me encourage you, to, if you're able to, to get up early tomorrow morning and uh, sit at the feet of Brother Reeves. Uh, he has some excellent material that he's going to bring to us. I know it's early in the morning, but it'll be worth it if you get up and you uh, are a part of that study tomorrow morning. Our first speaker tonight is Brother John Gibson. Uh, I had the privilege of first meeting Brother Gibson when my son and his wife began to worship at Jones Road. I asked them uh, before uh, this when I knew that I was going to introduce him if there was anything I should say about John Gibson, 
And my daughter-in-law said, well, he's a Florida Gators fan. Now, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing or a safe thing to say in an Alabama crowd, but nonetheless, that is, uh, he, he affirmed that as I asked him tonight about whether that is the case or not. As you can see in the book, it gives a brief bio that John provided for us. I guess his allegiance to the Florida Gators started in the fact that he grew up in Oak Grove, Florida, which is in the panhandle of Florida. He spent a couple of years at Florida College, but he has been, and what we appreciate him for the most is the fact that he's been a gospel preacher since 1979. And as you can notice in the book, he's preached in a number of places. He's preached in Alabama, in West Virginia, Georgia, Florida. And for the last five years, he has worshipped, he's preached and worshipped at Jones Road, where uh, my son worshipped until he began doing some preaching as well. Uh, his wife, Janet, is here tonight, and he and Janet have two children and four grandchildren. He has a son that goes to Auburn. I don't know exactly how that worked out, that he's a Florida Gator fan with a son at Auburn, but nonetheless, uh, that is the case. He's going to talk to us tonight about who is God. We've just sung several songs that have enforced the grandeur of the God that we serve. What better thing is there for us to think about tonight than to think about who is God, how can we worship him, how can we serve him, and what is this creature, what is this creator that has made us and that we worship. Talk to us tonight, brother. I will say this, if you think it's a little strange that a diehard Gator fan has a son at Auburn, just ask me later what the name of my oldest grandson is. Um, it's far worse as far as I'm, but no, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, oh, it's great. I appreciate so much you're inviting me to be a part of this and extending me this invitation to talk about something that is, I believe, vitally important. I appreciate all of you who are here and Kyle mentioned the book. I do have a manuscript that's in the book. Um, they edited it. I don't know. It's probably good by the time they got through with it. But um, it won't be exactly what I say tonight. That's why I'm saying by the book, you know, because uh, I think you'll find most of the speakers will deviate a little bit. There will be extra information in the book that is not going to be covered. But I want us to think about this question Oh, there it is. There it is. Who is God? It is a vital question. It, this topic, of course, was assigned to me. I didn't get to pick the topic, but it would have been a good one to have picked. To think about who God is is so important. I want to begin in John, the 17th chapter, in verse 3. As I read to you very quickly a few passages that speak to the importance of our knowing God, that speak to the impact knowing or conversely not knowing God will have upon our lives. John 17 and verse 3, and this is eternal life that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life that they may know you. Look at, look at the other side of that. In 2 Thessalonians the first chapter, in verse 8, when he speaks of God coming in judgment, he says he would, of Jesus, would, he would come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. To know God is eternal life. To not know God is to suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. In a very familiar passage to us in 1 John 4, Verse 7, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. To fail to love is proof that you don't really know God. And yet, he says over and over, you must love. In 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, the apostle here is speaking about the importance of self-control, of sexual morality. He said, you're not to live in the passion of lust, verse 5 says, 
like the Gentiles who do not know God. Why are the Gentiles so immoral in their lives? Why does immorality characterize them? Paul said they don't know God. It's that simple. I'm not saying anything you don't already know. I know these things. But I think sometimes I found myself not talking about the importance of knowing God as much as, much as maybe I should have. You see, we live in a culture of shallow emotionalism, a culture that talks about let, we need a relationship with Jesus, and it can be the most nebulous kind of a thing that doesn't really mean much of anything except they've got a bumper sticker that says, I love Jesus, maybe a fish that's attached to the back of their car. And we go to a passage like 1 John, the second chapter, and we see that if you love God or know God, you keep his commandments. Now by this we know that we know him, verse 3 says, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. I don't know, maybe I'm the only one that's ever done this. But I think sometimes because of the emotionalism of knowing God that people want to talk about, I end up just stressing, well, the key to knowing God is keep His commandments. Well, if you know God, you keep His commandments. But is the apostle telling us that if we've got the list of all the instructions God's given and we can check off, I've done those things, that means I know God. Is he not rather saying to us, we need to come to know our God. We need to come to love our God. And when we do that, we will obey him from the heart. We will be genuinely committed to him. And we will not be checking off a list. We will be children serving our Father. It's said in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17 that God dwells in light unapproachable. I can't tell you all about who God is. I can't explore all the depths of that. We will not know that in this life. But I am confident that the inspired scriptures of God give us what we need to know. And of course, I was given the lecture in Genesis. We will look at some other passages. But we're not, you know, if you're thinking about, well, he didn't say this about God. There are a couple of things possible. One, I just didn't think about it. That, that's always a real possibility, you know. But the second is, I was trying to stick to the book of Genesis largely. And by the way, and I'll make reference to it, there's one point that I'm not even going to talk about at all tonight that is in the book. But time will get away from me. In the beginning, God. Oh, if I turn this on, it'll help, won't it? There we go. They told me there'd be a clicker up here. They didn't tell me I had work to do like turning it on. That's, uh, you, know, I mean, this, you know, that's too much for me. In the beginning, God, when it started thousands of years ago, God was already there. God, and I, I love what's said in Psalm 90 when Moses would say that he is from everlasting to everlasting. What I start thinking about God is the pre-existent one. And not just that he pre-existed, that he's going to continue on. I began to think about how that sometimes, maybe in the political realm, there will be somebody in office that we don't care for. You know, that we think, I just wish that person weren't there. And then we go, well, you know, Four years, six years, case of a Supreme Court justice, we go, well, they can't live forever. You know, but we realize that at some point, this one we don't like will be gone. Don't think that way about God. You know, if you're thinking, well, I don't like the things that are in the Bible. I don't think they like the things God set forth. Folks, he's not going anywhere. He will still be God. On the flip side of that, though, have you ever, maybe it was a president, maybe it was a, a mayor of a small town, 
and you really, really liked this person, you thought they were good for the country, good for the town, then what happens? Their term expires. They get old. They're no longer there. That won't happen with God either. If we are loving and serving our God, we can have every confidence. As the Hebrew writer would say, chapter 13, 5, He will not leave us or forsake us. He will always be there. When you serve and realize that God had no beginning, therefore He will have no end, it can inspire fear in you, but it ought to inspire confidence and trust. Of course, I think if you think of Genesis and God, the first thing that comes to mind is the Creator. God has described or described Himself to Abraham as Almighty God. And while I completely reject the so called Big Bang theory, the Bible opens with a pretty big bang. I mean, God says, let there be light. And what is there? There's light. You just think about this. In six days, he speaks it all into existence. What a powerful beginning it is. You know, chapters 1 and 2, as you're aware, give two complementary accounts of the creation. Chapter 1 would focus on the cosmos, and the that is just an awe-inspiring scene. It ought to to put within us a realization that our God is mighty. He is awesome. Romans 1.20 would say of God that we ought to see in the things created His eternal power in Godhead. Hey, there are plenty of people who will say there is no God. There are plenty of people who want to dismiss God from their lives. But there's no excuse for that. As, the, as Romans 1.20 says, they are without excuse. When you see the order and the beauty, the grandeur of this great universe, catch a good clear night and just go out and look up to the heavens and see those stars. As the psalmist would say, hear their voice. And you will know there is a God and we ought to be serving him. In chapter 1, there's also something, and I don't want to step too much on the question of what is man, but he tells us in 26 through 28 that God created man in his image. When we think about our creator, to a degree we're thinking about ourselves, no, we're not eternal, we're not almighty, but like our God, we are given the ability to reason. You pay attention to the creation account. He creates the animals. Then he creates mankind. Mankind is not the highest of the animals. No animal is made in the image of God. We are made to be like our creator. We're not to act like animals. We're to treat other people with respect. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, when they come off the boat, the ark, he says, if, if a man were to shed blood of another man, by man his blood is to be shed. Why? Because in the image of God he was created. Treat other people as special. In the second chapter, the creation is more focused. It doesn't tell us about the animals and the sun and the moon and the stars. It says he created a man, and that man was alone. And he made for him a wife. Chapter 2 reveals God as the creator, not just of this great universe, but the creator of the family relationship. Our world, our, our culture is in trouble when it comes to family. The breakdown of the family has created so many societal problems. It creates problems within the church. In general, our society has lost the idea that God is the creator of family. If Jesus would be asked about divorce, he would say, have you not read, and where does he go? Genesis 1 and 2, that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female. He said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. When we take marriage lightly, 
It really is a testimony to the fact we don't understand who our God is. Our God is not just the one that gave us those beautiful mountains to admire, who gives us the beauty of the sunset. He is the creator of the marriage relationship. As the creator, he is the governor of it. And that brings me to the next point. He is a lawgiver. There are a lot of folks who they see in this creation the undeniable evidence there's some kind of higher power. You know, there is a God, they will sometimes say. That, that's fairly common. You know, there's really a relatively small proportion of Americans who are true atheists. People believe there's a God. But the percentage of people who recognize God as a lawgiver, now that's much smaller. You start at the very beginning. When God puts man in the garden, he gives him some instruction. He's to tend and keep it. But then he's also, verses 16 and 17, forbidden to eat the fruit of that one tree. Check the offering of Abel, I mean of Cain. Has been deceptive with Abimelech. Abimelech has taken Sarah to, Sarah to be his wife. And the Lord appears to him and says, you're a dead man. <laughs> you have violated my law. And later Abimelech will say to Abraham in verse 9, How have I offended you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Abimelech realized there's a God in heaven who has a standard who does not allow a man to take another man's wife. In Genesis 39, you remember when Joseph is being seduced by Potiphar's wife and you know, she's been after him and he says, you know, Potiphar's entrusted me with all these things and he's making all these statements about what Potiphar has done and you expect, if you've never read it before, you would expect the sentence to come out. And how could I betray that trust? And he said, how could I commit this great sin against God? He knew there was a lawgiver. God hasn't always had the same laws for all people at all times. What God demanded of Noah would not be the same thing he would demand of me today. What God demanded in the age of Moses is not always the same as what he would demand today. But lawlessness has never been accepted by God. He has always been a lawgiver. It may be called in James 1.25 a law of liberty, but it's still a law. God expects obedience. And God is an enforcer. I, you know, there are folks that they see Yahweh as giving out some rules, but a lot like you know, the old Santa Claus. You know, everybody's heard, all the kids have heard about Santa Claus keeping that list of those naughty kids. And then, come Christmas morning, everybody's got a present. You know, it's like speed law enforcement in Atlanta. Any of you ever been to Atlanta? You know, as you, you get closer to Atlanta, the speed limit drops and the speed increases. <laughs> I'm, I don't, I used to live over there, lived there for nine years. Go back occasionally. I don't think I've ever seen anybody given a ticket for speeding there. Uh, you think God is that way? It doesn't take long to get into the book of Genesis and realize God is not just a God who says don't do it or do it, whichever. He's a God who enforces. You know, we'll read later in the Bible, Hebrews 9, 27. After death, there's appointed judgment. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, 10, we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Third chapter starts us off. Adam and Eve, they broke God's commandment. And you start seeing the curses. You see the eviction. You see the cherubim and the flaming sword keeping them out. You go a little further. In Genesis, the sixth chapter, 
God will see that I'm going to destroy man. And he brings down the flood. In the seventh chapter, it will state in verse 21, all flesh died that moved on the earth. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all the verses. But you're familiar with this. You know what happens in chapter 19 with Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, even like in chapter 38 with Ur and Onan. Ur did wickedness before God. God slew him. Don't take God lightly when it comes to the matter of sin. When God gives an instruction, whether it is a positive injunction or a prohibition, you better take it seriously and understand He is an enforcer. But thanks be to God, He's also a God of grace. In all honesty, you're not going to see anything approaching the fullness of God's grace in the book of Genesis. We have to come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we have to see that cross before we can begin to appreciate it in its fullness. But we see it in Genesis. We see these glimpses of it, these foretastes of the glory that would be later revealed. He's going to destroy this world because it's so wicked. But it said Noah found grace in his eyes. Noah, he looked favorably upon this man. And what did he do for that man? He gave him, we might say, a plan of salvation. He gave him instructions that he could follow and be delivered from this. And he did that. When he destroyed Sodom, you remember that he spared Lot. Brought him out of that city. He would have spared this whole city. If there had been more. I want you to look at something in 2 Peter 2. Starts at verse 4. This is one of those as I sometimes say. I'm glad I'm past that point of having to diagram sentences. Because verses 4 through the first half of verse 10 are all one sentence in the New King James. I wouldn't know where to begin folks. I'll be honest with you. But I can tell you what the point is. Now, he names the angels that sinned. He talks about the flood. He talks about Sodom. And he says, here's his point. Verse 9, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Our God is a God who enforces, who knows how to reserve the unjust, as he said, under punishment for the day of judgment. But our God also knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Our God is able to help. He is a God who is merciful. He's gracious. I think about his grace seen in how he delivered the family of Jacob. As he worked through Joseph in that provision. I'll talk a little more about that one later on. And of course, there are those prophecies. As the curses are being pronounced, as the man and woman are being driven from the garden, there is that promise that that seed of woman, though his heel would be bruised, would bruise the head of the serpent. Satan, in the form of the serpent, he won that day. God was giving assurance that he would raise up a victor over Satan. When Abraham has taken Isaac on the mountain, been ready to offer him, and God had stopped him. Blessed. What did Paul say in Galatians 3.16? That seed is Christ. I could, we could explore in that with the ram that took the place of Isaac and Our God. Our God is one who is to be worshipped. Oh, I know sometimes when I'm teaching classes on Genesis, I wish I had those instructions that he gave to Cain and Abel because it would help me to answer the questions people ask. But God didn't give those to me. But it's pretty clear that there were instructions given. Else, why would he not respect the offering of Cain? 
Hebrews 11, 4 says that Abel offered his sacrifice by faith. We understand that true faith in God comes from hearing God's word, Romans 10, 17. What's the first thing Noah is recorded as doing after coming off the ark? He offered a sacrifice unto God. Chapter 8 and verse 20. He built an altar to the Lord, took of every clean animal and every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Look at chapter 12 of Genesis. I want to just hit a few passages quickly as we look at Abraham. Verse 7, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. You see, this one who's worshiping always. Chapter 13, verse 18. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. In chapter 14, when Melchizedek comes out and blesses the God of Abraham, it says that Abraham paid tithes. Hebrew writer explores that more. Now just stop and think for a moment. When you see God as the Almighty who has created heaven and earth, when you see this great power of God, then you see this God who bestows grace and who knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and all the various things. How can you not worship this God? How can you not give unto Him praise and thanksgiving? And yet, let me give you a caution. I don't know that I need to give it to this audience. But our world needs it. Our God is not just to be worshipped. Our God is to be worshipped as He directs. You, you start right there in Genesis 4. I mean, that ought to drive home the point. Cain offered worship, but it wasn't acceptable to God. And that's just setting a pattern that will be continue throughout scripture coming to John 4 and verse 24 when he would say that God is spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth we've got to worship him that way in the book you'll find at this point a, something about being a keeper of his covenants but I want to move to the God of all nations I love the story of the first part of Genesis Partly because they're just great stories. Those are the stories we've known all our lives. You know, I know there was a point in my life when I didn't know about Noah and the flood and the Tower of Babel, but I don't remember not knowing that. You know, to be honest with you, there are things that I have to admit I learned a lot later in life, a lot later than I probably should have. But I've always known those stories. They're great stories. You know, God took and He scattered those nations. But then... He chose that one man. And what does he do? He develops one nation out of Abram. And from Genesis 12 onward, the Old Testament is focused. It's not exclusive, but it focuses on one nation. But even as he's doing all of that, look at a few play passages. Chapter 12, verse 3. In you, that is in Abram, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In 22 and 18, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. You go on. He speaks to Isaac, chapter 26, in verse 4. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Chapter 28, in verse 14, to Jacob, in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He said it to Abraham. He repeats it to Isaac. He repeats it again to Jacob. You think that might have been an important point? That our God, as we begin, as we begin to follow the story of God and His dealings with man, it, 
in Genesis. It may for a while appear that he's just the God of Israel. But he's already told us. I've got all, all the nations in my mind. I'm going to be the deliverer. The seed of Abraham will be for all nations. Can I give you a couple of thoughts from that? That's our hope. I'm not descended. I mean, I'm not saying you couldn't trace somewhere back up the line somewhere and find Jewish ancestry in me. But it's not the predominant in my family. And I dare say not in the great majority here. You would be the exception if you're of Jewish ancestry. But God was telling Abraham, I've got these people in mind. I'm going to use your family to bless them. I look at Galatians 3, and he says, Everyone who is of faith is of the seed of Abraham. You know, all these who have put their faith in Christ and been baptized into Christ, they're Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. When you read Genesis 12, in Genesis 22 and 26 and 28, you just see yourself there. And God thinking of you. But I would also say there's a very real sense. When I see the God of all nations, I need to see my charge, my responsibility. That God wants his gospel to go to all nations, to all peoples. You know, by all means. Travel this world and preach the gospel if you can. But realize in a very real sense here in America, all nations have come here. We've got every race. We've got every ethnicity you can imagine. And if we are the people God wants us to be, if we are the people who are like our God, then we will love people the same way God is. We will want to be a blessing to all nations. Let me give you another one. The living one who sees. I hope you're ahead of me. You're thinking, I bet he's going to talk about Hagar. Right. Genesis 16. Genesis 16. Go to Hagar and Ishmael. Do you remember? Abraham and Sarah were people of remarkable faith. But this was one of those occasions where kind of got a little ahead of God. Sarah said, I'm not having a child, so take you know, my handmaiden. The marriage relationship from the beginning was to beat the two to become one flesh. They've introduced a third into this, and you remember it causes conflict. And Sarai's hard on Hagar, and so she is fleeing. Now let's watch what God does. Verse 7. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, means God heard. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. Come down to verse 13. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Ber Laharoi. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Bered. Her child was to be named God hears. God heard. She says, who are you? Who is God? He is the one who sees. She called this well, Ber Laharoi. The margin says, the well of the one who lives and sees me. We go through the book of Genesis. And you will see God intervening directly in the lives of people many times. We should not expect 
that kind of miraculous intervention in our lives. And yet, the God who would see Hagar fleeing, the God who heard her cry, is the same God that we serve. We ought to pray to Him like Abraham did. Abraham would plead with God for Sodom. And we ought to have the same confidence that when we cry, no, God's not going to engage in that conversation. I'm not expecting that. But I should have the same confidence that he's hearing me, just like he heard Abraham. That when Abraham's servant, remember him going to the world, and he prayed, it that way the prayer of a righteous man avails much telling those men of Baal they couldn't get Baal to send down the fire well maybe he's on a journey maybe he's gone to sleep the English standard says maybe he's relieving himself. You know, just poking fun at them because their God wasn't hearing. He wasn't seeing. Our God does. When we're children of God, what an encouragement that is. But can I add, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14 said he'll bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing. If we're not what God wants us to be, if we're not striving to walk in the light, if we are, Matthew 12, I'm, I'm sorry, Luke 12, talks about being aware, being, being aware of hypocrisy. He said, put it away. Why? Because he said, the things you're telling in secret, they're going to be proclaimed from the housetops. God knows your secrets. You're not hiding from him. As we get close, I've got two more points I want to make with you about God. We sang a song about the providence of God. The miracles of God in Genesis, they, they, they leave us awestruck. I mean, they make us sometimes, and I don't mean this in any kind of a flippant way, we just say, wow. You know, not just, wow, what a God He is. But as I get older... I become more and more impressed by how God's providence worked in various stories. There I mentioned the, the servant who goes to the well, Genesis 24. You, you believe God answered that prayer, right? That was the one that God intended? Did God force Rebekah to go out of the city at that particular moment? To be willing to water the camels, she didn't know what the test was. It just worked out that way, you think? No, I don't think it just worked out that way. In chapter 31, there's one that, well, the story starts in chapter 30, where Jacob is trying to, he's trying to game his this situation. He's got Laban, Laban keeps changing up things on him, so he thinks, you know, he's going to get back at him. And, you know, he strips these poles, he does this. And there's an ancient superstition. And I've read some commentators who would go on about this and how that maybe there is something to know. No, get to chapter 31 when Jacob is explaining, and he says, the angel of a God appeared to me in a dream. And said then, verse 12, Lift your eyes now and see all the rams which leap on the flock are streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. No, they weren't literally. But God is saying, as far as I'm concerned, every time a male mates, it's one of these speckled, it's one of yours. God was taking care of the genetics and making it work out. The story of Joseph. 
sold as a slave, lied about by Potiphar's wife, thrown into prison, forgotten by the cupbearer, then promoted up to the governor. You remember how he viewed it. Chapter 45, his brothers, when they are finally reunited, they're terrified. Wouldn't you have been? You know, but verse 5, God sent me before you to preserve life. Verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Verse 8, so now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And later, some 17 or so years later, he'll repeat the same thing to his brothers again. He will say, God was in charge of all of this. Our God, and what he's portrayed here in Genesis is doing, is he could work through the free will of mankind when the brothers in their envy and in their hatred almost killed Joseph but relented and decided instead we'll just sell him off as a slave. Our God was able to work the deliverance of his people through that kind of evil action. Our God was able to take the lustful lie of Potiphar's wife. He was able to use the crop failure. Well, first of all, the bountiful crop, then the crop failure. Our God is able to work good things for his people, to those who love him and trust him. And I want to I encourage you, do not believe for a moment that because God may not work a miracle in your life, that God is not willing to work in your life. Our God, in His providence, is still a great God and is able to make all things work together for good to us. Let me give you one last one to think about as we close. A long-suffering God. If we have any humility about us, any real honesty about ourselves, then we really appreciate this quality of God. Peter brings this out in both First and Second Peter as he looks back to stories from Genesis. And he talks about how the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Why did God choose the way he did? You know, why? Would there not have been some other way besides something that took Noah years and years to build this huge barge? I'm sure there were other ways. But 2 Peter 2, 5 says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. The world got to hear the message for years. They may not have heeded it, but the message was there. You know, in 2 Peter 3, 9, he speaks in that chapter again of the flood and destroying but he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Our God is a God of judgment. But you think about, he waited with the people of the flood. He gave the people of Sodom time. He, he you know, Chapter 13, when he's 13 and 14, he's speaking to Abraham. And he would say to him, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. You know, I, I'm going to take, give you this land. But he was patient. Let me encourage you. If there's someone here tonight that's, that's not right with God, you ought to be overjoyed that God has waited and been merciful. And if we're in a right relationship with God, that God was patient to let us get to this point. There's a lot more that could be said. 
about God. But I hope in some small way what we've said tonight is served to strengthen your faith, to deepen your reverence for God, to make you more appreciative of Him, to really just want to know more about Him. I've been struck before when I read the story that we go over to Exodus for this one, but Moses has seen more of God than any man. And he says, God, I want to see more. I hope tonight, maybe I've just whetted your appetite a little bit, that you'll want to learn more about who this God really is, that you'll want to serve him. John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Make sure that describes your life. Not the next verse. For he takes vengeance on those that do not know God. Thank you for listening. Thank you, John. What a great start to an exciting few days we have together uh, to spend together in this lectureship. And uh, we really do appreciate you coming, starting it off for us in such a good way. Thank you very, very much. Uh, well, I'm not Lance Taylor. Uh, Lance is our director of operations. basis in the local area. Lance will be here during the day for wearing two hats. So I'm going to uh, uh, stand in with the uh, commercial message. Uh, <clears throat> if my wife was here, she would say, why am I not surprised? I spent 40 years in sales and marketing, so uh, you probably noticed to your right a selection of products from the CEI bookstore. Um, <clears throat> and so we decided this year to bring as much of the bookstore to you as we could, just save you a trip from going downtown Athens. So if you have an interest in any of the products that we have, and especially in the lecture book. Uh, the lecture book is here and available, and is a summary of all the lectures that are going to be presented this week. So take time uh, either before or after one of the lectures to see Tammy Woodward, our sales manager, and her team, uh, and they can answer any questions that you might have about the array of products that Truth Publications uh, publishes. Thank you again for being here this evening. We encourage you to come back in the morning at 8 a.m. and be with us uh, all the way through our closing lecture on Thursday evening. Uh, should we have a closing prayer? So, who's? Okay, let's, let's be led then. Yes. All right. was preaching yesterday from Philippians 3 about finishing the race and crossing the line and in the prayer tonight mention was made of those that are aged and several that are here that we are inspired by in their example. As many of you know Brother Connie Adams is one of the elders at the Hebron Lane Church of Christ in Shepherdsville, Kentucky. He just completed his 900th gospel meeting over in Houston, Mississippi and was planning to drive over here with Bobby to be at the lectures. They never missed the lectures, of course. Bobby has been 
declining physically in the last year or two, very noticeably. Uh, she's lost her sight in one eye, and the other eye is under constant medical attention. Brother Connie's sight is also failing. Every time he goes out on a meeting, we pray and hold our breath. They were planning to drive over here from Mississippi, but they were exhausted. And let's please include them in our prayer tonight. They are here with us in heart to be sure. Let's go ahead and stand and have the closing prayer. 